You are listening to a sermon by Dr. Richard Caldwell produced by Walking in Grace. Walking in Grace is a listener-supported ministry. Visit walkingingrace.org media to learn how you can help these messages reach more people. Good morning. It is a joy to hear you sing. Matthew chapter 18 is where we're going to be in our study of God's Word this morning. Matthew chapter 18. For those who are visiting with us for the first time, we are making our way through the Gospel of Matthew on these Lord's days, both morning and evening. And we have come to verses 15 through 20. We dealt with these verses last Sunday in two sermons from a sort of a high-level view of it, sort of a helicopter view of it. We, we talked about nine principles uh, to keep in mind for the correction of God's children. As we said last week, and we've been saying for a few weeks now, the entire chapter, Matthew chapter 18, deals with that subject, how we are to live as the children of God. And when you come to verses 15 through 20, uh, our Lord is dealing with the correction of God's children. And so we took two sermons to deal with these verses. And then I said that we would just walk through them verse by verse, and that's what we're going to do this morning. Matthew chapter 18, we read beginning at verse 15. The Word of God says this, Now if your brother sins, go and show him his fault, between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, Let him be to you as the Gentile and the tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Let's ask our God's blessing on the time of our study of his word. Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters. It's a joy to be together this morning. And it just seems, Lord, increasingly um, the weightiness of what your church represents is impressed upon me. And as I think about the current state of affairs in the world in which we're living, as I think about what the next generation or two will look like if our Lord should tarry in His return. Uh, Lord, it's just impressed upon me that these days are of high importance. Our gathering together is weighty, and Lord, I pray that that would be impressed upon all of us, that we would recognize that at any time and in any age, These are things you've commanded, things that are essential for us, but especially in difficult times. Oh, how important it is that we uh, are close to each other even as we walk closely with you, that we would exhort each other all the more as we see the day approaching. So Lord, even now as we turn our attention to your word, would you help us to give you our best attention? Would you help us to be strengthened to receive the things you've revealed in your holy word. May your spirit be at work in me as I preach and in us as we listen, and may the result be transformed lives. And Lord, even our desire and our prayer today is that some would be saved, some who don't know you, who do not yet know you and do not yet know your son. May this be the day of salvation for someone. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If anyone expected that they could join a church, 
that did not deal with sin issues. Right? You, you join a church where sin never raises its head, <laughs> where there's never a need for confession, where there's never a need for repentance, where there's never a need for forgiveness, and not just you know, one or two, but multiplied sin issues in a fellowship. If, if you thought you could join a church like that, it could only be because you had not read your Bible. I mean, just read the New Testament and you're going to meet with church after church after church. Just read the seven letters to the churches in the book of Revelation, our Lord addressing each of those seven churches and assessing each of those seven congregations. And right away, you're alerted to the fact that the church is a place where we deal with sin. And in the same way, if you ever imagined that you could join a church and those sin issues would not affect you personally, that you would never be the one needing to confess sin, that you would never be the one in need of repentance, that you would never be the one who would need someone else to forgive you, or that you would never be sinned against, right? I mean, you're going you're gonna to witness people dealing with sin issues, but but you won't have to deal with it. No one will ever mistreat you. No one will ever have to confess sin that they've committed against you or repent about something they've done toward you, that you would never need to grant forgiveness after you've been sinned against. If you thought that you could join a church and it would never, you know, sin issues would never touch you personally, then again, it would be because you had not read your Bible. Something wonderful about our God and about His Word is that we are never left with false expectations. He has prepared us with Scripture to live as His children. He has prepared us with Scripture to live life in His family. And one of the things that He has made clear is that you and I are going to deal with sin issues. The family of God is a place where we deal with sin issues. That's what our Lord is teaching His disciples about in our verses, not only informing their expectations, but giving them a set of steps, a process by which we are to deal with these sin issues when they arise. Even if we have read our Bibles, even if we would say to one another today, hey, hey I know that the church is going to be a place where we deal with sin issues. And I know that I'm going to be, as a child of God, someone who deals with sin issues, even where we acknowledge that intellectually, we have to admit it's still a test when it comes time to practice it. It's much easier to say that we know that we sin than it is to actually acknowledge our sin. It's much easier to say that we know we're going to have to humble ourselves and admit where we have done wrong and ask for forgiveness. It's much easier to say that than it is to actually do that. And it's much easier to say that we know we're going to be sinned against and that we're going to have to forgive each other than it is to actually forgive each other when the time comes that someone has done that to us. It's easy to talk about these things, but it takes genuine faith to practice these things. And that's what we're going to think about together this morning as we walk through these verses. How do we practice this? It's not just about what we know. It's not just about what we can rehearse with each other and talk about in a Bible study class or in a sermon. But how do we actually live like this with each other? And as we do that this morning, we're going to talk about three things to remember for the correction of God's children. <clears throat> three things to remember as we deal with sin issues in the family of God. The first one is this. You see it in the first part of verse 15, we, we must remember the problem envisioned. The problem envisioned. Pay attention, remember always when you're dealing with sin issues, this text and the situation that our Lord was offering to us as He's giving us instruction about this matter. What, what, what is it that He envisions in these verses? And verse 15 says this, Now if your brother sins... Go and show him his fault between you and him alone. 
If he listens to you, you have won your brother. And on the instruction goes. If your brother sins. And there is a, um, a textual issue here, a, a manuscript issue. If you have the ESV, I, I believe it says, if your brother sins against you. And so the words ace, se are present in some manuscripts and not in others. It, it's a difficult question as to whether it was original or not. But as it is with most of these minor variations, it doesn't make a big difference in the interpretation of the section at all. Because if you look down at verse 21, it is clear that sin issues are as near to us as brother against brother, right? Peter came to him and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. So, so clearly just the next verse beyond our particular section, we're dealing with that issue. What do I do when, when my brother sins against me? And then when we expand our vision out to include everything in the New Testament, it's also just as clear that the sin issues that should concern us as members of the family of God are not just those sin issues that involve me personally. I mean, someone has sinned against me, but I'm also to be concerned with sins that affect the entire body of Christ, that in that affect the entire congregation of the Lord's saints. So when we talk about living as a member of the family of God, sin is an issue we ought to be concerned about, both when it affects me personally, one-on-one, -on -one, and when it affects me personally as a member of the church as a whole. For example, Paul reproved the Corinthian congregation because they had not taken action regarding a man's sexual immorality, presumably with his stepmother. And from that incident, Paul actually expands his application to include every believer, and he gives a list of all kinds of other sins that we should not just accept in other believers. So, so there plainly, it's not just sins committed against me, but sins that affect the church. 1 Corinthians 5, 9, listen to what he writes. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone, anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So that, that's an issue that actually reached the level where the person should have been put out of the congregation. And the Holy Spirit of God, through Paul, is reproving that church because they had tolerated it. They were not dealing with it. It's plain, that's not just my brother sinning against me. That's a brother sinning with his stepmother, but in a way that threatens the purity of the entire congregation. And then I mentioned those seven letters to the churches in Revelation. In two of those addresses, our Lord reproves congregations because of what they were tolerating. The church at Thyatira, Revelation 2.20 says this, But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. The Lord of glory, the chief shepherd of the church, is rebuking a local congregation because they're allowing a, 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 a woman who is a false teacher to operate in their midst. The church at Pergamum is rebuked in a similar fashion, Revelation 2.14, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and to practice sexual immorality. 
so also you have some who hold the te teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Speaking to the entire congregation, because there were some in the congregation living in these realms of false teaching and false practice. So, sins committed against us individually, verse 21. Or how do we deal with this? Sins that affect the entire congregation. How do we deal with that? Our Lord is giving us the instructions. And again, this is something to be practiced. Much easier to talk about it than to do it. We know this. I mean, how many times have you had great advice for someone only to struggle with something very similar when it, when it came home to you? <laughs> right? They're out there in the midst of it, and boy, you got every answer. This is what you need to do. Should have done that long ago. Why does it take you so long? And then it's you. And now you're struggling. So I just want to underscore that. This is not just for, you know, checking the boxes and, and adding some more information to our knowledge base. This is something for us to walk in and to live out. So the first thing we remember is the problem in vision. The second thing we see in the text is, now remember the process prescribed. When we meet with such a problem, remember the process. What are we to do? If your brother sins, go and show him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as the Gentile and the tax collector. This is the process. Now, a few things, four things I want to point out about this process. First of all, we are called to be proactive. We must be proactive. The first point that Jesus makes is that it's the one sinned against or the person who has a knowledge of the sin issue who is to engage the person who committed the sin. If your brother sins or if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Go and show him his fault. Now, one of the things that I want to underscore we talked about last week, if we ask what kind of sin do we go to a brother about, at what point of sinning do we confront another person, I want to remind you of 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, which teaches us a kind of toleration. It says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. If you and I were to confront each other over every sin that we commit, we would exasperate each other and exhaust each other. I asked the question last week. I'll ask again this morning. How many of us sinned this past week? Answer, all of us. All of us. Whether it be in the realm of thought Speech, attitude, motive, response, behavior, we all sinned this past week. So if you say, well, then what sins are to be confronted? I think the answer of Scripture is clear. Those sins which are, are scandalous in nature, which, which would uh, reflect severely on the testimony of Christ, the testimony of the gospel, the testimony of the church, things that must not be tolerated, those sins must be confronted. But any sin that becomes characteristic in a person's life, it's not occasional, it now is a pattern, and it's proving to be destructive to that person, perhaps even to their family, 
to the congregation. Now, that's a sin that must be confronted. Galatians 6.1 gives us that guidance. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. Any transgression. So, so now the sin is, is characteristic. He is caught in a trap. We, we see this pattern in his or her life. Now, this is something to be confronted. When you look at 1 Peter 4, 8 and Galatians 6, 1 and our verses in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20, what you also see is, is the manner in which it must be confronted, the attitude with which it must be confronted, the motive that should characterize the confrontation, the goal that we're aiming at, motivated by love. Love covers a multitude of sins. Uh, throughout our verses, we'll talk about it more in just a moment. What, what are you seeking to do? Win your brother. Gain your brother. So, so the goal is rescue. You, you are trusting the work of the Spirit of God. You who are spiritual, Galatians 6.1 says, you who are spiritual, this is a spiritual work. This is not a battle of wits or a battle of wills. It's not one person trying to do something for another person that will, will be explained by the power of the rescuer. This is, a, this is something that must be accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit. So trusting the work of the Spirit in an attitude of humility, in an attitude of gentleness, right? It's not harsh. I'm not mad. I love you. I care about you. If I'm, if I'm upset about anything, it's about the destruction that Satan is, is working in your life as a result of what you're blind to right now. This is what should characterize the process. And with all of that in mind, once again, I want to I say Jesus is teaching us that we must go Hupage is the word, present active imperative, second person singular verb, you go. And then he says, you reprove him, you show him his fault, you point out the offense. We must be proactive. Let me contrast this. What we don't do is brood. Someone sins against us or we recognize some sin and so what do we do? If we're not walking in this instruction, we, we might just be angry and just hold it internally. We, we don't brood. We love. We don't quietly hold bitterness. I'm not going to talk to you about it. We're not going to discuss it. I'm not going to bring it to your attention. I'm just going to, to not only be mad at you, I'm going to let it change our relationship. I'm just going to hold bitterness toward you. No, that's not what we do. We follow the process. We love people. We also don't prosecute them without a meeting. Have you ever gotten it wrong? Have, have you ever been offended by something only to discuss it with the person and find out you got it wrong? If you've ever had that happen, would you say amen? We, we have, haven't we? we? We misunderstood what they meant or we misunderstood what they were thinking or we misunderstood their motive, I mean, it happens often, doesn't it? So what you don't do is prosecute them without meeting with them. No, we, we love each other, which means we go to each other, which means we talk to each other, which means we listen to each other. This is the first thing we note in the process. It, it needs to be proactive. Second thing you notice, it, it, it must be private. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault between you and him alone. This is where it begins. The conversation is one-on-one. One-on-one. -on -one. One -on -one. Now, now, we do, again, we're confined to the text, but you, you expand out your vision and you recognize there are public sins which must be dealt with uh, regarding the scope of, of 
of the, of the knowledge of those sins. Right? As wide as, as the sin is known, this is how we must attempt to rescue and clear it up. But where the sin begins in a one-on-one fashion, the confrontation is to be confined to a one-on-one meeting. This is where we begin, one-on-one. How often do people violate that? Before we ever give an opportunity to the accused, we act like prosecuting attorneys with our friends. We accuse, we complain, we express anger, we express our hurt, we express how we've been offended, and we're telling everyone else except the person whom we say is guilty. Before we ever address the issue with the person that we say has sinned against us, we're already prosecuting the case in a public arena. Do you know that when you've done that, you're the one who's sinning? You're sinning against the one whom you say sinned against you because you're not following the process. You're not following the instruction that, that our Lord gives to us. So we're proactive and we begin at a private level. Third thing we note is we must be redemptive. If your brother sins, sins, go and show him his fault between you and him alone. Show him his fault. Reprove him. What are you dealing with? You're dealing with Scripture. You're dealing with clear violations of the truth. We're not talking about matters of opinion differences of of personal preferences. We're talking about sin issues. So you're able to demonstrate the fault between you and him alone. Now note, if he listens to you, you have won your brother. You have won him. Or you could say you have gained him. Cardino is the word. The lexicon has this, to acquire by effort or investment, to gain. You've won him. That that speaks to our hearts, doesn't it? You don't see the offender as trash to be avoided. You see the offender as treasure, your brother, to be gained, to be redeemed. What you want is for them to listen. The winning of the brother is the listening of the brother. They, they, they hear you. They see it. They repent. They turn from their sin. That's what you're after. The goal is not to embarrass them. The goal is not to tell them off. Yeah, I want to have a meeting. I want to tell them exactly what's on my mind. Is that the goal you see in the text? Is that the attitude you see in the text? The goal is not to drive them away. The goal is not to pay them back. Can I ask you this? When when someone has sinned against you, are you giving them room for repentance? I mean, do you want them to repent? Or isn't it true that sometimes we want to complain about what they've done and then we want to be rid of them? We don't really want their repentance because no matter what the offender says, The person sinned against doesn't receive it. They don't listen to the fact that the person has listened. (laughs) They've heard you. They've heard the case. They've admitted they were wrong. They've asked you for forgiveness, but then you, you don't want to receive what they say. Our Lord challenged our, our motives in Luke chapter 17. I want you to look there just real quickly so you can see this with your eyes. Luke 17 and look at verse 3. This, is, this really tests what goes on in our hearts when it comes to these sin issues. Luke 17, verse 3. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, what are we to do? Forgive him. Now notice this, this this is the challenge. And if he sins against you seven times, what are the next three words? In the day. Seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. 
you must forgive him. Now, I just want to ask you, for all the people who say, you know, you've, you've heard this teaching. I think they have it wrong. We don't have time to deal with it this morning. But the idea is that forgiveness isn't necessary unless repentance has happened. You're going to run into that teaching sooner or later. You're not called to forgive someone until they repent. Well, I want to ask you, Mr. and Mrs., you must repent before I forgive. I want to ask you, when they have asked for forgiveness the sixth time in the same day, are you beginning to doubt their sincerity just a little bit? What do you think? Seven times in the day. And they come to you on number six and say, I repent. Jesus says, you must forgive them. Now you see what he's dealing with is what's going on in our hearts. Are you hopeful? Are you hopeful? This, this is what love does. It, it hopes for the best. Are you generous? I mean, do you give generous ground for repentance? Or have you restricted what, what you call repentance down to something so narrow they really can't even repent? Are you generous in your forgiveness? Do you desire their repentance? Do you want to see the Lord change their life? Or have you already concluded they are to be disregarded. Many, many, many times when sin issues arise, there is work to be done in the heart, not just of the person who needs to repent and ask for forgiveness, but in the heart of the person who then is to receive their repentance and grant them forgiveness. Heart work has to be done in, in, on both ends. So, we must be proactive. It begins private. We must be redemptive. What we want is rescue. What we want is, is return. What we want is to be able to forgive. Which means, fourth, we must be receptive. We must be receptive. When our Lord says you've gained him, you've won him, what does that represent? It represents the end of the matter. Because notice... The only time you go to the next step is if he does not listen to you or if he does not listen to them or if he does not listen to the church. So, so we've got to be receptive of the listening party, the repentant party. If you've gained him, that means it's the end of the matter. That's it. That ends it. That's all you wanted. Which gets, goes back to something I said earlier. Do, do we really desire that? Do we desire for the matter to be settled? Or do we really want to keep it going? We want to nurse our wounds. We want to stay angry. As the saying goes, we want our pound of flesh. We want to make them pay going to make them pay because you're going to know I'm angry. I'm going to make you pay because you're going to know I'm pouting. I'm going to make you pay because you're going to know that it just can't immediately become like it was before. I'm going to make you pay. Or are you receptive to the, I mean, you were desiring their repentance. This is joy for you that they've heard you and they've turned because you treasure them. You're winning them. You're gaining them. They're valuable because they're a child of God and they're your brother or your sister. We must be receptive, proactive, private, redemptive, receptive. I can't tell you through the years how many times I've talked to people who have been in churches where a matter just continues and continues and continues and continues, and they say, I asked them to forgive me. And you can talk to the other party. Did, did they ask for this? Yes, they did ask for this. But, you know, dun, 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 dun. here's why it's still going on. And, and some, sometimes that's legitimate, but many times it's not legitimate. The issue is you just haven't 
forgiven him. And if you think that doesn't happen in churches, read 2 Corinthians, where Paul is having to exhort them now to forgive someone who has repented, treating them as if they had not repented when they had. It's a New Testament problem, you see. It's a people problem. It's a human problem. We don't just struggle to ask for forgiveness. We struggle to grant it. Which leads to the fifth thing I'll note about this, and this will cover the rest of the process. Because I feel like we dealt with the process pretty in-depth last week. We had nine principles for, for what we're looking at here, so I'm not going to go over all that again. But I will... I will summarize the rest of the process by saying this, we must be persistent. We must be persistent. Why do you then, if they won't listen, why do you go with two or three witnesses? If they won't listen to the two or three witnesses, which by the way helps us understand what, what it means by establishing the facts, because now they're not listening to two or three, not, not listening to, two or three witnesses. So the witnesses not only um, affirm the evidence, but then join the first person in saying to the person who has sinned, yes, you have sinned. Yes, you have violated the word of God. This is something you do need to turn from and repent. So, so the, now you have a three-voice testimony to a person. If they won't listen to that, then you tell it to the congregation. And the congregation affirms the testimony. And then you have the voice of the church speaking to a person saying, yes, you have sinned. Yes, you, you must turn from this. You must repent as one who claims to be a, a child of God. Now you have a congregational voice saying to a person, turn from your sin if they won't listen to the church then you must put them out of the church. That's the final step. What does this represent? It represents persistence. We don't just address it and forget it. We don't just address it and drop it. Until there's repentance, we continue to deal with the sin issue and the sinner. Why? Why are we persistent? Because of love. Right? Not because of anger, not because of retribution, not in a spirit of haughtiness and pride, not because any of us has arrived, but because we love the person who is destroying themselves. Do you realize even expulsion, when you put the person out of the church, even that is not absent the love of God? It's a loving act. Write this verse down. Look at it when you have time. 1 Corinthians 5, 5. 1 Corinthians 5, 5. You are to deliver this man to Satan. That's putting him out of the church. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that... There's a purpose statement. Why are we doing this? So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Take this action with the hope that this will result in his conversion or this will result in his repentance. If he is saved, and it, but, but has act like an unsaved person all the way through the process so that now we have to assume he's not saved, but if he is saved, may the Lord use this process to bring about his genuine repentance but if he's not saved, may the Lord use this to save his soul. Even that final step is a loving step. Why church discipline? Because we're jealous for the glory of God. This is, not, this is the Lord's church. Our God, we, we gather together to give our worship and praise, adoration and submission to our glorious God and to our glorious head, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is His church. And so jealousy for the holiness of God and the glory of God motivates this loving action because we understand the importance of the purity of the individual Christian's life. We are all to be pursuing holiness. And because we understand the importance of the purity of the congregation's life, 
this is why we deal with sin issues, all in a spirit of humility, gentleness, and love, all with the aim of rescue, the perseverance, the preservation of the saints. This is one of the means that God uses for that. The, the mutual love that's found in the family of God so that we're watching out for each other's spiritual good and willing to be involved in each other's lives, exhorting each other in a way that honors God because that's what's best for you and for me. That's what motivates all of this. So proactive, private, redemptive, receptive, and persistent. This is the process. The problem envisioned, sin one-on-one -on -one or sin that affects the congregation. The process involves those five elements. It leads us to our last point. Notice in verses 18 through 20, remember, the third thing we're to remember, remember the power promised. Remember the power promised. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two, or two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. A few things I want to point out. One, notice that Jesus emphasizes the power of God at work in this process. Don't ever believe, don't ever think that when you're dealing with the Lord's church, you're dealing with something that's just natural. The Lord is here. The Lord is here. We are dealing with supernatural things when we are members of the Lord's church. And I'm talking now about local congregations. We're dealing with supernatural things. Notice he emphasizes this in verse 18. Truly I say to you, before he tells us what he tells us about the binding and the loosing and all of that. He, he begins by saying, listen up, as it were. Truly, I say to you. And then in verse 19, he emphasizes it again by saying, again, I say to you. He's saying, don't miss this, my disciples. The Lord is involved in this process. Why does he emphasize this? To quiet our doubts. You know this, I mean, as I've already said, the church has existed now for over 2,000 years in, in various places, obviously, in various uh, ages, ver various seasons of time, societies that had just been birthed and societies that were on their last leg, so societies that had been influenced by Christianity to a degree that there was a morality in the culture and societies that were down at the bottom rung of the ladder in Romans chapter 1. And when you're in a society that has distorted what love is, and distorted what mercy is, and distorted what it means to care for people, and then you practice this process, you're going to hear screams, not just within the church sometimes, but outside the church, this is madness. This is heavy-handed. This is, this is not love. What, you, you put somebody out of the church? What are you talking about? Who are you people to think that you, you have the right or the authority to do such a thing? And so, living in a time like that, I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're living in Sodom, maybe some doubts begin to creep in. I mean, should we, should we do... I, have you ever heard this? Churches say something like this. We know that's what the Bible teaches. We just don't think we can practice that. When I came here 25 years ago, there was a man committing adultery in a public fashion against his wife, and that was the very discussion we had in a deacon's meeting. I don't think we can afford to do this, to discipline that sin. And what I sought to encourage them with was the thought, we can't afford not to. We can't afford not to. The church is not ours. It's the Lord's. We must obey his word. So, so when our Lord says, truly, I, I'm saying this to you. Again, I'm saying this to you. What does it do? It quiets our doubts. We're doing the right thing when we follow the process. It also emboldens our faithfulness. Now there's a courage, a strength. I'm not doing this because I thought it was a good idea. 
We're not doing this as a church because we came up with it on our own. We are simply striving to be faithful and obedient and submissive to the one whose church it is. We just want to carry out his instructions. That's all. And that includes, I've already hopefully overstressed even, that includes the right attitude, the right motive, the right goal. It's loving discipline. So he emphasizes what he says about the power of God at work in the process. Then he applies what he had said earlier about mediated authority. Look back at Matthew 16 for just a moment and look at verse 19, what our Lord says to Peter. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Peter, I'm entrusting to you, and and as a representative to, to to my people, to the church, I'm entrusting to you the authority to execute my instructions, to execute God's will on earth in the community of his people. So you can know this, if you're obeying my word, both in spirit and in truth, then the very authority of heaven stands behind what you do. When you you are truly faithful to the scriptures, all that is happening is what is being bound on earth is what has already been bound in heaven. What is being loosed on earth is what has already been loosed in heaven. It is simply heaven's will, God's will, being executed on earth through the the mediated authority of His church. That's all that is happening. God's will is being done. This is heavenly authority. Look back at our text. This is heavenly authority. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. This is heavenly authority. It it is the Father's activity. Verse 19, again, I, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. It is the Father's activity that we are witnessing. And what we are promised is the Son's presence and the Son's approval. Verse 20, for where two or three, remember those two or three witnesses, where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. So what you're involved with in the Lord's church is an act of heaven, an act of the Father with the presence and the approval of the Son of God. This is mediated authority, unique authority represented in the Lord's church. (laughs) And if you notice, this is even emphasized in verse 17. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church And if he refuses to listen, I love this, even to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, right? Who doesn't listen to the church? Who will refuse the voice of the church? Who can turn a deaf ear to that level of loving accountability? If he can do that, if she can do that, then you must assume they don't know the Lord at all, which is why they become to you as a Gentile or a tax collector, someone outside the fellowship of the community of the people of God. The church, dear ones, is unique. It is the pillar and support of the truth on this earth. And as I finish, let me just camp there for just a moment because I feel like I believe this is something we need to, to hear right now in our time I think this is something that Satan is particularly targeting in our day. There are powerful voices in the the name of evangelicalism even, right? Not outside the recognized realm of orthodoxy, but within it, powerful voices calling for the church to outsource the confrontation of sin. So if you've got a sin issue that's really heavy duty, you need to turn that over to the experts. That's not really something for the church to deal with. This is what the voices say. That's not something for the church to deal with. We need to outsource that. I mean, the little things, the day-to-day things, you know, hurt feelings and gossip and things like that. 
The church is meant to deal with that. But the, I mean, like a man having a sexual relationship with his stepmother, mother, I mean, where are the experts at? Let's outsource it. Or those same powerful voices call for the church to seek the approval of secular opinions in the confrontation of sin. Okay, we'll let you handle it, but you need to consult with us. You need to bring in an outside group to participate with you. There needs to be oversight beyond the local church if you're going to do it. So we'll let the church deal with it. I mean, some say just outsource it. Others say, no, okay, the church deals with it, but now let's bring in the outside experts to help you. Whatever form it takes, what they're questioning is, is the church adequate to deal with sin issues? Is the church adequate? And can I tell you, if we're not careful, that even begins to come into play in ways we don't immediately recognize. Let me give you one of those sort of very subtle attacks on the adequacy of the church to deal with its own sin issues. I want to be very careful, so don't misunderstand what I'm going to say. I feel like I'm treading on nuclear material here. <laughs> We've got to be aware that we don't even allow the biblical counseling movement to assume a place in the local church it was never meant to assume. Is there anything wrong with getting training in biblical counseling? Of course not. But what is biblical counseling? It is saturation in the Word of God and learning what it is to apply that knowledge to people's problems. And when you begin to view that training like it's producing some sort of counseling expert... So that now within the church, these sin issues are not dealt with mutually, but now there's an element of the church that deals with people's problems in the church. H have you been trained? Have you been certified? Do you have your certificate? Are, are, are you a, a recognized biblical counselor? Now, what have you done? You must have something. What you're really questioning, what, this, is, this is actually mind-blowing. In the name of the sufficiency of Scripture, you're actually questioning the sufficiency of Scripture. Because now it's not enough to be saved and to know the Bible and to be walking in truth and to have the Spirit of God. Now you have to have the training, which means the training is something additional to the sufficiency of Scripture to be able to help people with their sin issues. Can you see that? So not only are they, there are these outside voices saying the church is not adequate to deal with these things, but now even if we're not careful, within the church, I mean sound churches, we can confuse what training for biblical counseling would, would mean if it's rightly understood. If you want someone to take you under their wing and disciple you to know Scripture better and to know how to help others better, perfectly fine. Hallelujah. We do that in our own congregation. But now if you think that these are the only people qualified to help other people with their sin issues, you have totally misunderstood what that kind of training is meant to do. If you understand that, would you say amen? So these are attacks on, on what our Lord is saying. He gave the keys of the kingdom to whom? To his disciples, to his church, to his people, to this church, to other churches, which means we have the authority under Christ Jesus, mediated by him, to take his word in hand and to apply that word to the problems we're going to meet with in this church for sure. If you think you're joining this church and you'll never deal with sin issues, you must not have read your Bible. If you think you're never going to have to deal with it on a personal level, you will never ask for forgiveness. No one will ever have to ask you for forgiveness. You must not have read your Bible. The church is a place in the Bible where sinners are de redeemed sinners are still dealing with sin issues. And God has given us in His Word, in His Son, by His Spirit, all the sufficiency to be able to address those sin issues just like he means for us to do it. And he promises us where it's happening according to the process. He says, I'm right there. I'm right there with you. And Lord, I'll be with you even to the end 
of the age. And so the church must stand her ground. We must stand our ground in a world that doesn't believe in that sufficiency, in a world that constantly questions it, the church must stand her ground. Who are we by the will of God? 1 Timothy 3.15, If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Is there a place in the world where we find the truth, where it is upheld, where its beauty is displayed, and the answer is, it is the church. It is the Lord's church. So thanks be to God. If your brother sins, if he or she sins against you, if he or she sins in a scandalous fashion, if he or she, he or she sins in a way that now has become characteristic and destructive, thanks be to God, we're not left in the dark. We're told exactly what to do, how to do it, the attitude involved, the motive involved, the goal involved, the power involved. God has given us in His Son everything we need to glorify Him even when we're dealing with sin. Praise be to our God and to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for your holy word and thank you for the sufficiency that is ours in Christ Jesus and the sufficiency that you have granted to your church to deal with these matters. Lord, may we glorify you in all of our ways as we're seeing even in these verses, in our thoughts, in our attitudes, in our words, in our behaviors, in the steps that we take, in the goals that we hold in our hearts, in, in not just in a love that confronts sin, but a love that's willing to forgive sin, in a gracious uh, love that remembers how much we've been forgiven of. Lord, in that way, may you Glorify your great name in and through your church. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.